Hello, everyone, and happy Oceans Day. Thank you very much for being here with us today. This is Developing Ocean Policy, Promises and Pitfalls, a panel discussion organized by the IDB Group in collaboration with the Coastal Zone Management Unit of Barbados to broaden awareness on matters related to ocean policy and blue economy. I am Jennifer Doherty Bigar Rodriguez, and I'm the Senior Climate Change Specialist of the IDB here in Barbados. We are you might not see it online, but we are in the iconic Carlisle Bay in Barbados, one of the largest beaches on the island and right in the heart of its UNESCO World Heritage Site, historic Bridgetown and its garrison. In this hybrid event, we are pleased to have our expert panel comprised of online specialists. I will start with Jose Antonio Davalos, Ecuador's Minister of Environment, Water and Ecological Transition, as well as Mrs. Beverly Wade, Director of the Blue Bond and Finance Permanence Unit in Belize. But we also have people here. Here in Barbados with us, we have Janice Comabach, Senior Lecturer of the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies, CERMES, at the University of the West Indies Campus here in Barbados. Ilan Meirovic, Climate Change Director of IDB Invest, which is our private sector window. And finally, but not least, our moderator will be Dr. Leo Brewster, the director of the Coastal Zone Management Unit. But first of all, I would like to allow my IDB representative here, Viviana Alba Hart, to give a couple of opening remarks and present to you the following steps. Thank you, Viviana. Good morning to everyone here in Cala Bay and those joining us online. Welcome from beautiful Barbados. It is indeed a, a pleasure for us at the IDB group, IDB group to celebrate Oceans Day with the Coastal Zone Management Unit of Barbados. We are proud <laughs> to have been a trusted partner for this agency since its inception four decades ago. Its achievement has been driven by data and a strong commitment to preserving the island's precious coastal areas. Last December, during COP15, a historic deal to halt biodiversity loss was made. It was based on an ambitious global policy framework for addressing current challenges to managing and conserving biodiversity, both on land and underwater. It also emphasized the need to specifically deliver on ocean conservation and information. The commitment to protect at least 30% of land inland, coastal and marine ecosystems by 2030 was one of the most important accomplishments of this landmark agreement between nations. The ocean decade is now taking shape and we need bold moves, like the commitment that we are celebrating today in the case of Barbados. Our oceans cover about 70% of the Earth's surface, and so it comes as no surprise that more than 90% of all living creatures can be found here. In fact, scientists estimate that about 1 million species of animals live in the ocean. Despite its importance, much of our ocean is unknown. However, we do understand that crucial need to protect it and the need to better assess it as a natural capital asset. Oceans are major part of the biodiversity equation for island states are like Barbados, and they are a unique partner in the climate crisis as they serve as a natural carbon sink, capturing around 30% of CO2 emissions. Today, marine protected areas cover just over 6% of the ocean, almost 10 times as much as in the year 2000. Expanding these areas even more is critical for, protect, for protecting coral reefs and mangroves and maintaining the ocean's resilience to climate change. The interconnectivity between climate and biodiversity is a central element of the work of the IDB is supporting in the region. Indeed, it's a priority for the entire IDB group. Through IDB Invest, we are providing innovative solutions for the private sector to increase climate action and invest in the blue economy. And through IDB Lab, 
our innovation lab, we are promoting new technologies and solutions at the entrepreneurship ecosystem to foster long-term sustainability of the ocean economy. The IDB is supporting the government of Barbados in the drafting and approval of its ocean policy, a key element of advancing the country's contribution towards a more resilient earth. We look forward to our continued close partnership that will bring benefits for this, for this and the future generations. On behalf of the IDB group, I congratulate the Coastal Zone Management Unit team on its 40th anniversary. And to all of you, both here in Carla Bay, in Barbados and online, from around Latin America and the Caribbean, thank you for connecting with us on this World Oceans Day. I'm sure we will have a very enlightening discussion with important perspective that will help move us all forward. So thanks again and welcome. Thank you very much, Viviana. Uh, thank you very much for your resiliency for live events and streaming. Uh, but now we will be listening to the uh, Prime Minister, sorry, sorry not, not the Prime Minister, Minister Ford's uh, video. Please, uh, can we smoothly transition to the video? Thank you very much. Special invited guests, members of the audience, both online and in, and in person, a pleasant good morning to all. First, let me, of course, offer apologies for not being able to attend to this important dialogue, which is aptly titled Developing an Ocean Policy, Promise and Pitfalls, due, of course, to my cabinet commitments. The United Nations has designated this decade, 2021 to 2030, as the decade for ocean science for sustainable development. It seeks to stimulate ocean science and knowledge generation to reverse the decline of the state of the ocean system and catalyze new opportunities for sustainable development of the massive marine ecosystem. The vision of the ocean decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. In 2023, Barbados commenced the Marine Special Plan development process as part of the Blue Bonds deal with assistance from the Inter-American Development Bank and the Nature Conservancy. It is recognized that as part of this process, there will be the development of a Marine Special Plan policy that will specifically speak to the multiple sectors that use the ocean space. The Inter-American Development Bank, through a technical cooperation agreement with Barbados, has provided the necessary support for the implementation of the development of an ocean policy for the island. It is anticipated that this consultancy will commence later in this month. This brings me to today's dialogue. It is hoped that from the diverse panelists that we have present, that we can generate open, real, and frank discussion on the very experience encountered today across the world with emphasis on Latin America and the Caribbean diaspora. Community and stakeholder involvement in the process, the need to develop appropriate policy frameworks that provide the best opportunities for successful management of our resources in an integrated, sustainable way, using the time-tested but our approach will require input from all stakeholders. As part of this process, our legislative framework will need to give quite consideration, of course, to have a better reflection of the ongoing and future ocean activities. This has been initiated in the island's recently upgraded Integrated Coastal Zone Management Act, which is in the draft final stage of operation. One of the specific objectives of the ocean policy being developed for Barbados will be to ensure a national commitment to implement the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 14, life below water. As our national ocean policy is developed, it must influence a more prioritized structured approach to sustainable national ocean planning and linking to a more accurate and transparent budgeting, implementing and monitoring. Additionally, surveillance and enforcement of our ocean space will need technical and physical enhancement. To best achieve this, 
it will be necessary to give consideration to the establishment of an enhanced coordination mechanism. In essence, a Blue Economy Steering Committee. Such a mechanism had been previously identified within the Barbados Blue Economy Roadmap and Strategic Action Plan. These documents were coincidentally developed with assistance from the Inter-American Development Bank and Conti Caribbean. However, given the expanding nature of the requirements for effective and implementable oceans management, perhaps the time is approaching for concerning the establishment of a national oceans office. The greatest challenge for Barbados will be on the implementation of an overall integrated ocean management model. Overcoming the challenge is critical for the future in which the plight of local coastal communities must be borne in mind from the onset. I encourage all development partners, stakeholders, coastal communities, and the general public to become active participants in the Green Spatial Plan process, as well as the ocean policy development process in order to attain the maximum desired benefits from both of these initiatives. Finally, today we commit to the development and implementation of an effective ocean policy and the marine spatial plan for Barbados. I once again extend heartfelt appreciation to the IDD for hosting this event and their continued commitment to Barbados in the execution of its coastal and marine conservation activities over the last 40 years. To the coastal zone management for their continued dedication over the same period of time. And of course, to our sustainable development of our island's coastline. This webinar discussion will be highly insightful and this will, will provide useful opportunities for further participation and follow up with direct interactions with persons seeking to embark on a similar journey as Barbados. May you have a successful discourse this morning. I now take the pleasure in declaring the webinar open. I thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your inspiring words. But we will write, we will go straight away to the discussion. And I will now give the floor to Dr. Brewster, the moderator of today. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, Minister Ford, Minister Jose Antonio de Valos, Minister of Environment, Water and Ecological Transition in Ecuador, Ms. Beverly Wade, the Director of the Blue Bond and Finance uh, Permanence Unit in Belize, Ms. Helene Mirjovic, the Climate Change Director of IDB Invest, Mrs. Janice Kambabach, Senior Lecturer at CERMES UE. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to Barbados and to this Ocean's Day webinar. I want to wish everybody a happy Ocean's Day and thank the IDB for hosting this event as the, as the minister rightfully pointed out in his speech. I think that what we have to recognize is that as a small island and developing state with an ocean space that's 425 times our own land mass, we have to start looking as an ocean state to dealing with the extensive maritime area and the significant living organisms and inorganic and organic materials that may be found in the uh, marine environment that can contribute significantly to our country's blue economy and long-term development. I think it's also important to recognize the environmental characteristics that are found out there. And Barbados, through the Coastal Zone Management Unit, is looking to work on a marine spatial planning process that will help us better coordinate, identify, and implement the most effective mechanisms for managing our ocean space. But paramount in doing all of that, we also have to work on establishing an ocean policy or an ocean policy framework for the island to carry us forward in this venture. Today's meeting is to help look at the issues, the promises, the pitfalls that others have experienced in looking to roll out the ocean policy concept. And the panelists that we have are well versed in the area themselves. And I think that what we should do is just lay some ground rules. I'm gonna pitch some questions. Uh, everyone will have like three to five minutes to respond and then uh, we'll move on to the next person, right? Um, I think that 
given the nature of the type of work that we're doing, it's important for us to probably start at the top. So let's start with Minister Devalos. Minister Devalos, how do you see the role of oceans as drivers for economic growth? And how do you foresee countries implementing ocean policy for climate change? First of all, good morning to all of you. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you, at least in, um, in online. Hopefully, uh, we could be together soon to celebrate such days as this, the, the, the day we celebrate the oceans we have. Um, um, with your permission, I'm going to, to answer your question in Spanish, since I've been told we have a simultaneous translation. Um, pues, Para mí, como decía, es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Eh, well, autoridad. as I've said, it's a pleasure for me to be here with the authorities of uh, of environment and beautification of Barbados, with whom I have the honor of sharing this morning. And of course, the IDB and other entities that have made this meeting possible. Going into the subject for Ecuador, the ocean has a very has a crucial role in our economic growth and development so it's not in vain that oceans can be used as growth drivers and a good example is fishing and aquaculture it is no secret that ecuador has a vast coastline very rich in marine biodiversity and this turns us into the the into a good place for the sustainable development of these fisheries that generate thousands of jobs, increase the production of food, generate more income. They allow us to balance or try to balance our balance of our trade balance through our exports. And of course, it also turns us into a destination for tourism. And well, it's no news in, in Ecuador, we have the, the Galapagos Islands that provide us very uh, a lot of marine richness throughout the year, regardless of, of the season or the climate, it's possible to enjoy the Galapagos. And this allows us to not only benefit from this community, but also the whole country. And we are now focused on promoting sustainable tourism activities with the promotion of tourism activities that have an environmental impact that is very low, such as diving, surfing, the the watching of, of marine species, and that, of course, help us promote economic growth, as I have already said, not only of the archipelago, but of Ecuador as a whole. And another economic growth drivers that we cannot leave aside, although it, it still needs a lot of work, is the generation of renewable energy. And in this, we already know that oceans can also be used as a source for the generation of this energy through the energy that we know as, as wave energy and also marine wind energy. And obviously it's important to study where or research where this could be done and where it can't. But as a country, we are very open to exploring this and hopefully develop this in the near future. And in fact, in Ecuador, we are currently working with private sectors to try to find a regulation that will allow us to protect waves the waves because of what they represent in ecosystems as well as what they can represent in tourism and of course in these mechanisms for the generation of renewable energy that has still not been developed in our country this would allow us for example to diversify the energy matrix in ecuador reduce our dependency on fossil fuels if try to focus on a decarbonization of post oil ecuador and obviously generate employment related to the sector of clean energies. Our country beyond this, and as several of the countries that accompany us today know, we are part of this group of 17 mega diverse countries that have enormous potential for the development of scientific research. And oceans 
are, are not left aside from this. In oceans, there is a great deal of information that is extremely valuable and that represents an enormous possibility to have access to the genetic resources that are found there. And once again, we can say that oceans are the perfect space for sustainable economic development because scientific research brings with it new discoveries, new findings, new jobs, new investments, and a resulting benefit for humanity and for our countries. And obviously, we cannot leave aside maritime transportation and logistics that although it in, in large degree, uh, world logistics depends on maritime transportation, our access to the Pacific Ocean is very favorable to be able to develop and improve our participation in foreign in foreign trade. But this comes along with a need, the need to modernize our ports, to improve transportation networks so that we can have the lowest level of greenhouse gas emissions and the implementation of advanced technologies that can strengthen our competitiveness as a country, as a logistical center to increase the revenues that come from maritime trade, trade and a reduction of greenhouse gas um, emissions in, 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 that impact not only this, but other areas. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Minister Davlos. I think that uh, the, the clear demonstration by Ecuador towards the blue economy space and how they're generating multiple sector approaches is, is dynamic and helps lead us into the next question that I'm going to ask Ms. Wade from Belize. An ocean-based approach to growth offers marine and coastal resources opportunities. How do you see the blue economy approach evolving in Caribbean countries in general? Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and the opportunity for inviting Belize to be a part of this distinguished panel. Good morning. So yes, as we've been discussing um, in the introductions and from the Honorable Minister, um, the, blue, the blue economy approach really offers an opportunity for us to contribute to our economic as well as, for, as our environmental and climate and social targets through the rationalized and sustainable use of our ocean resources. As a matter of fact, um, I believe the World Bank is estimated in 2012 that approximately $407 billion is generated from the Caribbean Sea to, to our nations. And in Belize, we're no different. Um, we have estimated that our um, ocean resources in terms of coral reefs and mangroves and their associated ecosystems contribute approximately $1 billion to our national economy annually through tourism, fisheries, and shoreline protection. And so in 2020, the Ministry of the Blue Economy was established in Belize and in 2021 launched its national framework for blue economy, which is seated in the principles of low carbon, resource efficiency and social inclusion. And it's expected that the Belizean economy would increase our gross domestic product um, through a, a thriving blue economic um, development pathway. Um, that of course is holistic, um, socially just, um, robust, science-based. Um, but central to the realization of robust blue economies is the rationalization and planning and the integrated approach of these ocean resources. And so we must have a departure from sectorial management to a more multi-sectorial approach, which, which includes holistic management of our marine ecosystem. Uh, most countries, including Belize, has followed a sector-specific policy plans and regulations for their ocean resources and activities. And this approach Approach has not resulted in optimum economic development or protection of the goods and services provided by our marine resources. And so there's an urgent need for us to have a more integrated multi-sectorial blue economy approach to ensure a robust and sustainable ocean economy. One of the things that we believe um, should be taken on board, and I, and it's a, I see Barbados has um, launch their marine spatial planning process um, 
is that we should now look at that informed, rationalized um, approach to the ocean space and our resources to guide the optimal use of our our um, resources and to meet our goals. Belize launched its marine spatial planning process last year, and it's expected to, to be um, integral to the delivery of our blue economy policy framework and national targets um, in our ent for our entire ocean space. And they were expected to deliver on that in, in the next five years. Um, that marine spatial plan allows us to build sustainability in current sectors and to look at new emerging sectors as we move towards a more nature positive economy. Um, in fact, global analysis suggests that for every dollar that you invest in mangrove conservation and restoration, it generates three dollars. For every dollar in scaling up of scaling up offshore wind production, it generates um, estimated two to seventeen dollars for every dollar in decarbonizing international shipping and reducing emissions. Um, it generates approximately um, two to fifty-eight U.S. dollars. So there are potentials that a blue economy approach can unlock for our our nations. Two last points I wanted to make is that. The blue economy approach and the planned approach can also create opportunities for innovative non-traditional financing mechanism that deals that um, allows us to realize um, our key development, key economic, key climate and environmental targets. Um, through well-designed PPPs, debt instruments, and sustainability-linked instruments. Um, having a planned approach for our blue economy and, and a good accounting of the blue assets that are contained in our blue space equip us with this information to now have more meaningful partnership with private sector and with development to finance um, sustainable and robust blue economy. And finally, um, there is opportunity for scale, for a regional approach and scale. So while a mix of what constitutes a blue economy depends really on national circumstances, there's opportunity for us to scale the approach regionally to enhance our delivery on our regional, social, and economic um, benefits for our people for today and for the future, and for all our very ambitious restoration, um, conservation, climate, resiliency, um, and natural capital um, ambitions for our marine and coastal ecosystem and our ocean space on a whole. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Ms. Wade. I think that uh, the, the points that you raised in terms of the interconnectivity of sectors, the ability to build out your blue economy space, the regional approach is also important, and it segues really nicely into the approaches that are being taken at UE CERMES in terms of how we can continue that outreach to research. So my question to Dr. Kambavach is really truly, in your view, what is the knowledge and research missing to accelerate ocean policies within the region, Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Dr. Brewster. Of course, that can be an extremely long list, but I think that in forests such as these, it's important to maybe highlight the main ones that people can go home with. So let me start by suggesting that as we talk about World Oceans Day and we consider our ocean, which has been considered important for a very, very long time, for decades, Let's not forget the precautionary approach. We speak of a precautionary approach, but we don't necessarily infuse it in what we do. And as we continue to talk today about all of the opportunities of the blue economy, I just want to sort of bring that reminder. And we have decades of applied research and development from the Global Environmental Facility International Waters Project, and several other initiatives that have been developed as part of the, of the um, Caribbean Large Marine Ecosystem, the CLME, and other adjacent LMEs. Ours, the wider Caribbean region, is very, very diverse along many dimensions. And so it's not always easy and sometimes actually inappropriate to generalize across Latin America and the Caribbean. 
And indeed, the Global Environmental Facilities Large Marine Ecosystem Initiative is still ongoing um, across like 44 countries and territories. But if I had to find common ground in terms of a common knowledge and research agenda, I would reach to the work that was done by the CLME Transboundary Diagnostic Analysis way back in 2010. And they identified the areas of fisheries management, marine habitat conservation measures, and pollution control as key areas for knowledge mobilization and research. And that hasn't changed. I believe that notwithstanding the specificities of the Caribbean or Latin American regions, those areas are consistent across all, you know, all oceans. Now, we've done a lot of applied research at CERMES, as you said, in the areas of marine science policy interfaces. And we have looked at and identified several gaps. This is no surprise to anybody, the fact that we have data. It's not that we don't have it. We may not always have all that we want, but we have it. What's happening is that it's not being translated or transformed into information and knowledge for decision making. So we need to bridge that gap between the data that's being collected. And indeed, when you bridge that gap, you begin to, begin to understand if the data that you have collected is valid and reliable and credible for what you want to do. So we need to look at issues such as oceans monitoring and evaluation systems. And as Barbados moves forward with this spatial planning process, that was my timer to myself to stick to your time frame. <laughs> um, as we move forward with our spatial planning process, I want us to consider areas such as ocean monitoring and evaluation, improving our technical and scientific capacity. I think we are privileged in Barbados to have a fairly high ratio, but we can always improve this. We need to look at our policy cycles in terms of how policy is rolled out and the integration of that science and tech you know, that data into it. And just basically fundamentally talking about that science communication, that rich science literacy that needs to be improved. I think that's a, a useful point because we recognize that, uh, you know, well, coastal zone management unit lives on data, but as you've rightly pointed out, the ability to translate that into policy is something that we now have to be working on and it becomes more critical, especially as we roll into the MSP process. So I agree. And then that will also speak to how an ocean policy can further uh, generate a, a driver towards effective ocean governance. Um, for, for Mrs. Miorovic, I would like to ask you, through the IDB Invest Program, the new studies that have been generated talk about investment opportunities that can support the transition away from destructive practices and create new enterprises and approaches that have net positive outcomes. Can, can you give us examples? Yes, uh, thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for having IDB Invest in as part of the conversation. As uh, Jennifer mentioned before, I am part of the private sector arm of the IDB group. So we work mainly with private sector clients. So in the conversations that we have with clients, they bring more and more business models that are linked to the, to the ocean. But how do we evaluate what business model is good? What is sustainable? How do we make sure that is including the communities when we are engaging with those private sector um, opportunities? So that was the question that we raised at the beginning of the year. And we decided to prepare a publication that is actually uh, published today, and you can find it on our website, on business models and business trends, uh, trends for marine conservation. And what we did is we understand that more and more the private sector is interested in bringing up sustainable business models because of two, three, three main reasons. One, customers, the products that they sell need to be sustainable. More and more, there is an, uh, an interest in buying a sustainable fishery, right? Two, the investors. Investors are looking for sustainable assets, for sustainable products. And third, and it's not least, employees. Employees are interested in participating 
and working in companies that have a sustainable target. Those three forces are combining for the private sector to find solutions and to find products and business models that are sustainable. So what do we do with all these offers? So we went back and we created a framework that would help us and other banks to analyze investments. And the framework is based on looking at the environmental impact, the social impact, the financial success, and also the government measurement, the, the governance of the process, right? So with that framework, we basically have found three types of business models that are moving forward. One is what we are calling a payment for ecosystem services, but it's not the traditional payment for ecosystem services. You know that many companies, private sector companies, have adhered to the race to zero. They have commitments. They have engaged in carbon neutrality or net zero. And so they have an interest in reducing their carbon footprint. And now on Monday, as you probably have seen, the UNFCCC launched a framework to make sure that non-state actors' commitments are credible and transparent. So there is a big push for all these private sector companies to achieve certain results. And pavement for ecosystem services comes as a way for the companies to engage in paying for a service, for example, mangrove restoration, coral restoration. And with that, they can attribute that to their own carbon footprint or their carbon uh, target. For example, we have an example in our publication of, of Ibero Smart, Ibero Star, um, that did um, a program with the government of Dominican Republic to start uh, doing conservation and restoration of mangrove. But they are also doing it there in their own sites, in their own hotels. The um, uh, payment for ecosystem services also serves for coastal protection or biodiversity, right? So those are one type of business models. The other business models that are coming up is the su uh, supply chain premium. So what is happening with the supply chain premium is you already have a supply chain of fishery, but all of a sudden you're paying extra because it's sustainable to change the certain practices, to, to change and adhere to certain criteria. So that premium goes back for exactly that, um, basically conserving the marine areas to have a better uh, fishery production. And that type of uh, um, examples or models are very good in the sense that the relationship of the supply chain is already established. And what is it's estimated is that it can provide a price of an up to 11% more of the regular fish. So there is an additional income for communities that get involved in these type of mechanisms or these types of business models. And the third, the last one, is the one that you've been talking about and, and Mr. Davalos was also mentioning before, is sustainable enterprises. Sustainable enterprises that come from the start as thinking as a sustainable business, sustainable tourism. Uh, you can have now um, tourism that is dealing with restoration and regenerative tourism, what it's called, um, or other business models like the ocean cleanup that basically sources plastic from around the world and sells it to Nike to produce shoes, or Patagonia that is creating products basically including plastics in their clothing. So those are sustainable uh, um, enterprises. So those are three types of business models that we're seeing more and more. And the issue is how do we fund it? But I think that's the next question. So I'll keep you waiting. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I think that uh, those points are useful because it also demonstrates the capacity for the private sector to become more actively involved. And in some situations, I don't know how it can work within the small island context where you have a, you know, this risk averse sort of environment sometimes for people to invest. But I think the, the opportunities once they are being actively explored and presented can lead to new business ventures that can be viable. And I think that that's something that we really need to start looking at uh, down the road. Uh, Mr. Devalos, I haven't forgotten you. But I just want to congratulate Ecuador 
on completing uh, the world's largest debt for nature conservation deal. Could you let us know how these actions support and promote the economic and social reactivation of the country? Thanks a lot. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, you, you know, just where to trigger our, our national pride. So, so yeah, well, just to tell it as, as, as quick as I'm able to, we have to consider that this uh, debt swap has two uh, phases, so speaking. So in one hand, you're having a, a saving for Ecuador of a uh, thousand and a hundred million dollars in debt service. And in the other hand, you are having uh, 450 millions coming uh, for sustainability projects here in Ecuador. So regarding the, the, the saving of more, more than a uh, thousand million dollars in debt service, um, we're trying to generate more trust globally for uh, investment, uh, for loans to come to Ecuador that can even give us more opportunities to, to generate, to create um, uh, jobs, to create economic and social development here in Ecuador, which will eventually give resources for education, health, and so many other needs that uh, here in Ecuador we, we, we could attend with these resources. And in the other hand, which is actually what as the Ministry of Environment excites us the, the most, is that we will have $450 million that will be handled by a fund. This fund is called the Galapagos Life Fund. Through this fund, we will try to uh, enhance the maintenance of the, of the protected areas we already have in Galapagos. We will also try to work in the development of the natural capital, the biodiversity uh, we have in Galapagos through its uh, ecosystems as long as uh, the oceans, as well as the as the, the land we have in, in Galapagos and the communities, of course. And, and it will work through the, the through grants. We will give some grants for projects uh, uh, or financing these projects that can come from NGOs, can come from government agencies, uh, can come from, from anyone who already has a project that they would like to implement in Galapagos. Uh, they could get a grant from the GLF, as we call it. And, and these grants will go to projects that basically have to, to be regarding uh, economic and social development, sustainability, um, scientific investigation, economic investigation, uh, uh, sustainable tourism, uh, blue economics, but also uh, infrastructure going for the communities with an approach of climate change. Uh, for example, we could think of, 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 of water projects that have to in, include um, climate change uh, criteria in order, in order to get a grant from the GLF. This will help us through 18 and a half years uh, with this money that annually will be used in the grants, but it will also go a part of it for a, a permanent fund. So even after these 18 and a half years, we will have, we, we assume it will be something between 100 and $200 million in this fund that will keep working through the year. So, so we are also um, guaranteeing that Galapagos will have, will still have these resources even after 20 years from now in order to invest in these projects that will help the economic and social development of the islands. Uh, thank you so much, Minister. I think that that's clear that being able to use the resources that come from the, the approaches that you have taken to, to provide the, the cross-sectoral, uh, cross-national application demonstrates the, the benefits that can be derived from this process, especially when you have a large uh, debt for nature conversion activity taking place. And while you're focusing, especially on the areas of marine conservation, the social amenities still have to also be recognized and implemented through that process as well, because anything that happens on the land reaches the coast and then the marine environment. Um, Ms. Wade, I'd like to get to you now, just to look at your perceptions as to what are the good examples of successful uh, deals like the blue bonds and loans that are actually becoming more pronounced now and you're seeing more of the 
developing countries that, that have coastal and marine areas to conserve, looking at in terms of how they're gonna be raising the ambition of our region generally to look towards how you're gonna integrate ocean policy. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Uh, it's it's clear. Uh, so so thank you. And again, I want to congratulate Ecuador on now having the largest uh, blue bond globally. Um, but as with um, Barbados, Ecuador, and Belize, what these financial deals does, it allows us to now integrate into. Um, these binding um, deals, national policy for ocean conservation. Um, in the case of the blue bonds, what it did, it allowed, um, similarly to, to Ecuador and to Barbados, it, it, it allowed us to now, um, through debt conversion, to now have investment in our natural capital in, in our oceans and integrated in, in our Blue Bonds deal in Belize is national policy. The, the, the trust of the deal is contingent on, on a list of policy deliverables and, and, and key um, tangibles on the ground as it relates to marine conservation and the sustainable use of our resources. And so I think more and more, these kinds of financial deals are becoming um, a, an excellent option for us to now have these mechanisms, these well-structured deals that now allow us to have policy enshrined in them and to also have them financially um, with, with, with a financial um, obligation attached to them also, and also providing the necessary finances to deliver on these high ambitions that we have. Developing no. countries like Belize have very high ambitions, but we all have this financial gap. And what these deals are doing is giving us the opportunity to now help solve um, this financial no. gap. And at the same time, to have a realistic um, time frame for delivery on our on, on our ambitions, but also at the end of the day to um, realize long-term sustainable financing for them. And in the case of Belize, uh, we had our sovereign debt of five over 500 million US dollars. And from the savings that we got on that, um, we had uh, we, we had some fiscal um, flexibility, which the government was also free to invest in so in in its other social pro programs and development programs, but it also decided to invest in long term sustainable financing of up to two hundred million um, U.S. dollars over the next twenty years. What it has also done is that it has really created the kind of tested model for blue finance for ocean protection, as we we often um, refer to it, where we in Belize are now looking at leveraging the success of the blue bonds and to leverage the policy direction that the blue bonds have taken to now look the design of a finance a, a project for finance permanence along with 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 new partners to even bring more long-term sustainable financing for our marine and coastal um, ambitions and targets so the innovations with blue bond, with with bonds and I know there's some good example of sustainability like bonds are are now providing that opportunity for us to now build into these very important financial mechanisms and deals um policy and 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 that for achieving our much uh, our ambitions as it relates to climate and the sustainable use and conservation of our ocean resources. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Wade. I think the points that you've hit on there are, are really important in terms of how you can use the, the blue bond approach to finance and refinance and generate finance for the ocean space and the marine environment, also coastal environment. 
which is something that you know people have for a long time also been looking to try to find the sustainable manner to have that done um and different approaches have been taken but this now seems to be the long-term approach to to having something that is going to be structurally sound that is going to help drive policy and also provide opportunity for the type of investment that we want in order to see the effective protection of our ocean space bearing in mind once again that as as minister ford said in his speech um the ocean decade is to to see an ocean that is long-term sustainable and um a decade for the ocean science that we want to see and the survivability in the long term and also the 30 by 30 goal that is a, a trans-global approach towards ocean protection is something that we all must aspirationally try to to attain uh over to you dr Cumberbatch. in terms of the aspects of climate change and and human interventions that are taking place now uh globally that have more or less over time contributed to sargasm, the dreaded word, especially within the Caribbean. We feel the impacts all the time. This seaweed is threatening our tourism sector across the Caribbean into the Gulf. We know the stories. What are your thoughts on enabling government officials and other stakeholders to build a science policy interface for ocean governance and sargasm management? The deadly question. No. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Leo. Of course, trying to keep this one as contained as the last responses would be a difficult one, but I'm going to try. A critical issue. At CERMES, we are running a project. It's about to wrap up now called Surge Adapt, and it was funded by the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. We asked representatives from government, private sector, and NGOs who are actively involved in sargassum management to self-assess their capacity to manage sargassum. And the truth is that they all reported low capacity, not surprised, right? They weren't so uncomfortable with things like coordination and stakeholder engagement. But when we started talking about monitoring and evaluation, when we were looking at the issues of what they were relying on in terms of evidence, actually evidence about the impacts, real-time data and analysis, very limited. That issue of data, which I raised before is key. I'm probably gonna keep saying it whenever I open my mouth this morning. Good science requires good data, bottom line. We have extensive gaps as far as how sargassum is affecting people, ecosystems, and national economies. We're getting better, but there's still more to be done. In the context of e economies, we need to do the type of analysis that will allow government officials, policymakers, even funders to mobilize action where we need that action to be. We need to understand the baseline pertaining to the market and non-market sources in terms of economic value, economic activities. What are people doing when sargassum comes? What, what are they substituting? Because we still have, it's, it still has to, tourism still has to go on, right? Um, we need to better understand how sargassum events are affecting ecosystems and ecosystem services spatially and temporally. Now, right now, we are trying to collect data from visitors. Before that bad boy COVID, you used to have the exit surveys at the Grady Adams Airport done by the Caribbean Tourism Organization. COVID shut that down. But the opportunity to go to visitors and say, what was your experience? And quantify that is really very important data that we'd like to have again. So if anybody is listening here or in um, Streamland, and you want to contact me about the opportunity to get into your departure area, we want to do that. This is an urgent plea. We have, a, we have a questionnaire. It's a QR code. You scan it with your phone, your tablet. You fill out the information. That gives us, exactly, that gives us tangible evidence, tangible data that we can translate to policymakers that helps them to plan better. So that, that wasn't rhetorical. That was a desperate plea. Please contact me about that. We also want to partner with agencies to scale up our research, funders and other ways. We're already doing great work with the forecast, and I see our chief fisheries officer here, Dr. Um, Shelley Cox, who is actively involved in the development of our Sargassum Outlook Bulletin. But you know how we have weather forecasts and hurricane forecasting that allows us to be better prepared? We want to bring Sargassum forecasting to that level. 
We can give you a lot of information right now, but we can't tell you which beach is going to beach on and when exactly. But if we could do that, which we could if we collect enough data and feed it into our models, okay, then hoteliers and people on coastal areas who are using that for their essential livelihoods could respond more effectively as opposed to, to living in dreaded anticipation of sargassum coming to their beach. And, and I want to cry every time I look at the Korean beach, which was among the top 10 beaches in the world. I know it's devastated. So we want to work with people on that. And then we want to be on the forefront of what do we do with sargassum? Because it is a resource if we could figure out how to make it into a resource. It is a healthy ecosystem out at, at sea. So we don't want to create a habitat problem for species. But we also don't want it when it comes to the coastline and you know, smothers reefs or beaches and creates the problems that we're experiencing. So we need to partner with people with the resources who can help us to do the type of research that we need to do to invest in making it into something that could work, like maybe biofuel. So there is that opportunity. And if we can get the resources, we can do that. And I wanted to bring along, you know, I'm a teacher, so we always have show and tell. This is some of what we have produced. I don't know if the cameraman can zoom in, but this is some of what we have been producing at Ceremies. This one is our toolbox, which is on our website. If you Google Ceremies, you will find us. This is our toolbox on cleanups, what to do and what not to do. And then we have several protocols that we've developed in terms of monitoring protocols on species and you know, understanding the, the, the biodiversity of the, um, of the sargassum better, um, you know, how to actually do this type of research in your own territory. So all of these are on our website and lots more material. And I invite people to go there because they'd learn a lot more than I would be able to say in five minutes. Uh, thanks a lot, Janice. I think those sort of outputs are good to know and essential, especially for, for small islands, especially across the region that may not have a clear understanding and guidance as to how best to manage sargassum when it touches down. Because we have seen the devastating impacts of heavy machinery on our beaches as well. And it's like the first immediate response that everybody wants to apply. You know, uh, we've also seen the long-term impact through the pervasive beach erosion created as a result of large sargassum mats washing on shore and devastating the coastline. So I want to thank you for that. I think that um, the concept of being also able to provide some sort of economic valuation in terms of the damage and focusing more so as well in terms of the potential for using it as a resource is something that we, we really have to get more detailed into as, as time is progressing. But while time is marching on, we are being suffering uh, immensely with the impacts, you know. Uh, Helen, I would just like to ask you, as we're getting ready to go into the wrap-up stages now, one, one crucial question, which is continuing along the same vein, there are new and innovative ways of funding marine conservation that support other social outcomes while achieving a financial return. Can you describe some of them? Yes, thank you. So... As I was mentioning before, and I think part of the conversation just now, I touched upon some of the examples of, of instruments. They, they mentioned the, the blue bonds or sustainable bonds that governments are issuing, but what's happening in the private sector? So part of the conversation on how to scale those models or ideas, you probably have heard of the concept of blended finance, using concessional resources at a better rate, to prove a concept, to test it. But then we need uh, commercial uh, resources to basically implement those projects as well. And in addition to that, there is a whole new area where there, you are developing carbon credits or biodiversity credits that are um, a way to, to fund. But let me just deep dive into the blue carbon credits. It was mentioned before, all the potential of carbon sequestration that the ocean has and mangroves and corals and you know all the activities if we do them sustainably. But what's the issue with carbon credits is that we have to know that we have a system for monitoring, reporting and verification. And we have to be linking it to the Article 6 of the UNFCCC Convention so on the Paris Agreement. 
So we have to work with those ideas of blue carbon credits or even biodiversity credits, understanding that we need to work together, private and public sector, to develop the monitoring, the registries, to know that we are actually doing and sequestering the carbon that it says that is going to be sequestering. So that's very important for carbon credits. With blue bonds, it, a concept that we have also seen that it's a spin-off of, of green bonds. Yes, there is a, a lot of requests by financial institutions in the, in the, the, in the region for, for green bonds that are linked more to renewable energy projects and now more and more blue bonds. But again, for, to, to, for them to have the impact that is supposed to be, you need to have the assets clearly determined. So you need a taxonomy. You need a framework to know that the private client is going to do what they are supposed to do with the resources from the blue bond. And then you need a SPO, which is the second party opinion that verifies. So it's basically the same thing as the MRV, but, but for private sector investments, right? So we need those concepts to make the blue bonds actually achieve the results that they are, um, they are expecting to achieve. And finally, the SLBs. The SLBs are the sustainability linked bonds. You probably have heard of them. They generally are linked to a step up or step down, which basically they either charge you more or charge you less if you achieve the goal. And in the context of, of the payment for ecosystem services that I was telling you about, those business models where a company is setting up a carbon neutrality or net zero target, what you do is establish a KPI uh, to basically link the pricing of that bond or that loan to the achievement of that specific KPI. And so those are the types of products that the market is, is producing, but there is a lot of work next to it that it has to be scientific, science-based targets and knowledge and monitoring and reporting of the specific results because otherwise we risk to have a greenwashing or a blue washing product. And so we don't want that. And those are the new types of instruments. And what we're doing is we work with our clients to do exactly that, to have robust and credible products that will achieve the outcomes that we're seeking. Okay, thanks a lot, Helene. I think that that is, as I keep saying all the time, new approaches, dynamism that is now coming forward to allow for opportunity for investment. And um, I really hope that the private sector actively starts to take and um, pay more attention to these sort of initiatives, especially within Latin America and the Caribbean, more importantly, the Caribbean and Barbados, especially, um, so that you can see that there are dedicated approaches that are tangible and can be easily traceable um, in terms of accountability, right? Uh, as time is passing, we do have time for a few questions from the floor. So if there's anybody with a burning question, just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Hi, good morning, uh, ministers, panelists, uh, Travis Sinclair, Minister of the Environment. I, I, I look to, is this good? Good morning, everyone. Um, so I, as I look to the, to, the, to the panel and I see my minister here, I, I, I see an opportunity. We have three countries. We have some partners, the IDB, UE, and what some of you might not know, both Minister Davalos and Minister Ford sit on the Bureau of the Form of Ministers. And they're about to consider a new oceans de decision for the first time. But within that space, we need action. And is there a cooperation opportunity, given the experiences of Ecuador, Belize, our coastal zone management unit, UE, to have an exchange cooperation platform. So we walk away from this exercise today with something to follow up. So I want to put that on the table. Um, Minister, I know you have to consider it at several levels, but I know you also want action. So that is my proposition. Over. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Sinclair. I think that um, 
that sounds like a very good proposition and worthy of future discussion at a higher level. Uh, <laughs> um, and I do hope that there is tangible outcomes uh, when the next uh, heads meet, but heads of the environment meet. Any other questions or comments from the floor? There's one. Good morning, everyone, ministers, et cetera. Uh, Anthony Headley, Environmental Protection Department. I listened very closely to the discussion this morning. And in my opinion, the blue economy is an extremely technical area. And you all mentioned this morning the issue of social inclusion, one of the, the, the discussions. And I'd like to hear some examples of how, given the technology driven industries within the ocean space, how are we going to achieve social inclusion such that the average individual doesn't necessarily have all of the education, et cetera, to deal with some of the technologies? How are we going to promote social inclusion to ensure that there's access and benefit sharing, both at the policy level and at the practical level for those persons on the ground who are really and truly just trying to earn a living? Thank you. Um, if I if I may, uh, part of the analysis that we did of the business models and the examples that we have in the publications takes into account um, social impact. And basically what we saw is that the projects that were able to include the communities from the start, from the design of the idea, were the most successful at the end of the day. Because otherwise, if the benefits only achieve, are, you know, for only part of the of the equation, let's say, for the business owner, and it doesn't trickle down to the communities that are actually going to source the plastic or they are going to do the sustainable fisheries, then it will not be taken root, and so you will not will not have the impact you are supposed to. So, let's say, for example, ocean plastics is part of the sourcing of the plastics, but part of the revenue goes back to the community, and it's part of the conversation with with the companies. And just to mention to the, the prior point, so on Monday, we had a conversation uh, between private and, and public sector here in Barbados, that's, that's why I was originally here, to have a conversation on solutions or um, the importance of marine conservation for the private sector as well. And the, the takeaway of that conversation on Monday was that we need to follow up with specific examples, with the roadmap, with the private sector and the public sector. Um, and Leo was there in, in the conversation on Monday. So the idea is exactly not, not necessarily, I wasn't thinking of a regional exchange platform, but there's going to be an exchange platform to bring these examples that I'm talking about to Barbados, to have conversation with you, to be able to showcase if that are examples that are feasible in this specific context. I suppose it would look odd if the sociologist on the panel didn't say something about social inclusion. So, as you know, we have a conservation trust in Barbados that is kicking off as part of the overall process. And there are similar um, entities in the other countries. This is an opportunity for funds to be made available to community based organizations and non governmental organizations to develop projects that can be implemented. What would be critical is building their capacity to come up, they have the ideas, that's not an issue, but build their capacity to make them viable. And we have more than enough capacity in organizations across Barbados and other countries to work with them to make it so. Because if we can get enough of those types of projects happening, you begin to get more and more people actually understanding and appreciating the resource and wanting to interface with it. I remember that when I was at the um, small grants program, one of the things that we used to talk is about all the little flames coming together to become one big fire. That imagery still works. And I think that one of the things that we certainly need to do in Barbados specifically, Anthony, is ensure that we see 
so many viable community-led projects. We tend to have interest groups more so than grassroots organizations. There's no reason that the Kiwanis and the Lions, who have always shown an interest in a diversity of areas, cannot also apply for these funds and do this type of work. Schools, the more of these activities that we can get, the more that the tangible benefits from the blue economy will begin to realize within you know, the communities at that level, increase that level of conservation literacy that we need in this country. I just wanted to add one last thing, everything that the panelists just said, but in addition to that, you have to consciously um, articulate in your policies, um, tar clear areas where you want to make intervention to ensure that these um, grassroots and, 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 and small MSMEs and community-based organizations have a, have a space and an opportunity to participate. So besides the capacity building that, that you're doing through the fund like we're doing here in Belize, you have to have a clear articulation of targeting and ensuring that you that you meet those targets of of, of engaging that um, that group or our vulnerable sector and to ensure that the national enabling environment now allows for them to to makes it easier for them to participate um, so in Belize, we also are not only working with the Conservation Trust Fund, but it is married by the national framework for MSMEs that was recently rolled out. So where, where we've created incubators and, 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 and various um, mechanisms to allow for them to now have an opportunity to also meaningfully participate. Uh, just a small reaction. So um, Travis was basically throwing me a small curveball, uh, but I'll take it. So the IDB is very much happy that this event uh, has an impact because right now uh, I would commit to keep up the work between uh, Ecuador, Belize, and Barbados, of course, with the leadership of uh, Minister Ford, Minister Davalos. So let's keep this conversation going. Uh, we want to go beyond words. Conversation needs to go into action, and that's why I'll give the floor uh, to Dr. Brewster to basically wrap up this excellent session. Uh, thanks a lot, Jennifer. I think that um, this session has clearly demonstrated that ocean policy is something that we are all working towards in various forms. Some of us have actually achieved it, and are, several of us are on the way to getting there. I think also it's important to recognize that the, the promises and pitfalls that have been presented indirectly have never really been openly put forward. But you can see that as you progress, there will be challenges and you have to overcome those challenges and you have to keep moving forward. I think with support, dedication and commitment from all involved, both the public sector, the private sector, these uh, community and service level organizations, the youth who were very quiet in here, Ashley. I think that um, is also important to to give due consideration to the processes that have to be involved, which, um, as Anthony and Mr. Headley rightfully pointed out, allows for all sectors from from policymaker right down to the grassroots individual have a clear understanding and appreciation as to what ocean policy, what marine spatial planning how ocean governance is going to be rolled out and implemented in the long term can be done through aspects of education, research, development activities, through investment, through the, the approaches that must be taken to ensure um, public sector and private sector co-financing and involvement in activities, through also looking at the opportunities for the, the community organizations to have a say we must get this job done. The aspirational target of 30 by 30 for all countries is something that we must work towards. And in order to do it, we need data, 
you need developmental applications, you need concerted effort to look to preserve the marine environment. On this World Oceans Day, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, both online and uh, present here in Barbados at Carlisle Bay, beautiful Carlisle Bay. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Ensure that you have a, a nice uh, World Oceans Day and remember the significance of the ocean. If we didn't have it, we couldn't breathe. It drives our climate. Climate change is real. We must do all that we can to protect ourselves, especially as small island states, coastal communities, developing states, et cetera, towards this and ensure that our marine environment is protected in the long term. Thanks a lot.